This is a production of Cornell University. Hello, my name is Marina Mann, and as Michelle said, uh, and thank you for that lovely intro, uh, this is my exit seminar for my PhD, and I'm very happy to be here. It's been a long time coming. Um, so a brief outline um, and also an acknowledgement to my special committee, including Christine Smart, Tori Hendry, Ed Buckler, and Lucas Mueller. Um, some people are virtual, some people I think are in person, and uh, a couple will be watching the recording. Um, and actually we are recording, right? So as, Mich as Michelle said, um, I am an entomologist and I grew up in Northern Maine in a little tiny town called Lee. And my favorite fun fact in college was that my entire town fit in one dorm. Um, and so while I was there in Lee, I was homeschooled by my mom, who's in the second row with my brother. and. Uh, I basically spent all day, every day outside looking at insects. I raised hundreds of caterpillars and every time I went out to grab food for them, I'd find more so then I'd have to raise those. And essentially I observed an incredible amount of diversity uh, in the insect life around me. And this is what got me to be an entomologist and started my uh, career as a scientist. So for college, I first went to the University of Maine in Orono and then I transferred my sophomore year to Cornell uh, to major in entomology. When I graduated or, or at Cornell, I first started working for Dr. Jason Dombrowski at the Cornell University Insect Collection. And if you've been watching the posters around here, you may notice that these are the Nabokov butterflies that I unintentionally chose this picture. Uh, they're also on the exhibit at Man, or they were recently. Um, and so for three years, I worked in the collection, uh, helping reorganize the Lepidoptera and the larval collection, which was just fantastic. I also did research in Dr. Jennifer Thaler's uh, chemical insect ecology lab, and under her then postdoc, Will Wetzel, he now has a lab at Montana State University. And so between the three of them, they were the first like real research that I got experience in. I also took every entomology class I could get my hands on here and just absolutely adored all the diversity, ecology, and evolution of insects. So after graduating Cornell, I was working at the Botanic Gardens, and as, as Michelle alluded to, I was also biking every Wednesday with this fantastic group of all-women cyclists. And we were, I was going up a big hill one day with Michelle beside me. I didn't know it at the time, but I was telling her how uh, I just graduated from entomology and she was like, I need an entomologist to manage my insect colonies. And so two months later on Halloween, <laughs> I started as a technician in Michelle's lab at the Boyce Thompson Institute studying molecular vector biology. And through her lab, I started getting involved in citrus painting research. <laughs> we'll try this again. Don't move. <laughs> I haven't really moved that much. Um, okay, <laughs> so I told I told everyone, including myself, no technical issues. Oh well. Um, so yes, lots of manuscripts as a technician. I started collaborating with the Mueller Lab, also at at uh, the Boyce Thompson Institute, uh, working on the Scilid Expression Network, and some of the work that came out of that I'll be talking about in a little bit. And finally. Because of everything I got involved in working for Michelle as a technician, I really wanted to start a PhD to further the questions that I had started asking and getting involved in anyway. So the motivation for my research is essentially, and, and this is Michelle's research as well, <laughs> uh, is to sustainably and economically manage citrus greening, also known as Huang Long Bing, and I'll be referring to it as HLB. The mission of our work is to halt the spread of HLB to new health increase. Okay, testing again. <laughs> Third time's a try. I should note that being a PhD and a scientist also comes with surprises. <laughs> um, and thank you on your feet. Okay. And so my goal coming into the research from HLB is to find ways to disrupt vector transmission. So yeah. about Hong Kong being, it's a tritrophic pathosystem. And there are three main players, the host plant, bacterial pathogen, and the insect vector. And together they create a long, long being. A 
And so why has it been so hard to solve HLP? We first found it in Florida in 2005, and it's about 20 years later, and it's still going strong in the U.S. And there's a few aspects to this triangle that are important to understand right from the get-go. We've got our bacterial pathogen that infects the host plant, our insect vector that acquires the bacterial pathogen, and the insect that transmits it back to the I'm so sorry, guys. <laughs> um, okay, Hong Long Bing, it is characterized early on by actually not having any symptoms. Trees can go three to five years without being visibly infected. However, during that three to five years, they are infectious. And that's when, and that's why this is such a problematic disease of citrus, because by the time you notice it in your grove, it could be half your trees. Once symptoms begin, the, one of the first ones you see is this yellow blotchy modeling in the top right. And then later on, the fruit starts to drop early, which is a really big problem for growers. They don't collect fruit that falls early. Also, fruit that stays on the tree is unevenly ripened and tastes really bad. Later on, we also notice that even though the tree is infected, it's not evenly infected. And so you can still sample a leaf from this visibly sick tree and it'll come up negative for the pathogen. And later on, of course, you have tree death. And this picture looks rather dramatic, but it's real. There's hundreds of acres of trees that look, are just bone dead. And um, it's quite hard on the citrus industry to come back from that. And so we know that Hong Long Bing has been described in China about 200 years ago. There's some stories of it being in Egypt 3,000 years ago, but it's all based on symptom description. And so it's a little hard to verify that. And it's also found in most, but not all, citrus growing regions across the world. In the US, one exception, for example, is Hawaii. Due to their island status, it helps them stay free of HLB. And the economic impact in the US has been huge. This is a figure from the Farm Bureau and it shows the decline in orange production by three states, California, Florida, and Texas. And while California has been pretty consistent, you can see that Florida has dramatically decreased. And as of this year, they're pretty much bankrupt in terms of the citrus production, which is really horrible for the local growers there. So from the perspective of the tree itself, we know that the tree mounts an immune system against the infection. We also know that if you supplement the tree with nutrients, you can eke out a little bit more life from it, uh, but ultimately it's not enough. And not all citrus varieties will react the same to the infection, but they are all susceptible. And when I was in Florida uh, in 2018, I was lucky enough to see what they were calling at the time survivor trees. There'd be this huge swath of dead trees and right in the middle, just beautiful, happy, healthy trees no reason at all. I don't, and, and that is still a mystery. But it happens in nature, natural resistance. And we'll come back to that theme. Uh, there's also efforts to breed resistant trees. And this is a, this has great potential. Anyone who's in plant breeding knows that. But breeding a tree <laughs> takes a long time. Uh, and so that is a long-term plan for managing HLP. We also know that at the tree level, there's roots, branches, and leaves, and even on the leaves, you've got the new leaves, the flush, and each of them has a different response to infection. We know that when trees are infected, their roots are very much reduced in volume. People on my I'm trying to project. <laughs> All good. <clears throat> so the other another part of the triangle is the pathogen. Um, in this talk, I'm going to be calling CLAS, or Candidatus Liberobacter asiaticus, uh, our pathogen. And this is what we have in the U.S. However, across the world, there are multiple species of Liberobacter. Even in the U.S., there are different Liberobacters, but among different plant systems. But um, all of them are intracellular and phloem limited. They live in the sap of the trees. And they're unculturable, except for one species, L. crescens which we use as a proxy in the lab to try to help understand how severe factors uh, interact with their environments. The, by nature of having two hosts, the citrus plant and the psyllid, or and the vector, we also have a reduced genome for this pathogen. And every time it gets transferred from tree to vector and back to tree, it undergoes a severe bottleneck. 
And it's amazing that it hasn't evolved even faster than it already has. And last but not least, we do know that this genomic variability exists even in the US. Um, a study that I was on out of Michelle's lab with Dr. Higgins um, showed that in just seven years, our colony that's been raised in a lab uh, differs from field collected psyllids or field collected bacteria by over 156 different single nucleotide polymorphisms including many in genes known to, help, known to help confer antibiotic resistance. And so this underscores the importance of making sure that any results you do in the lab are translatable to the field, because we know that our lab colonies are very much different from those in the field. And last but not least, my favorite, the insect vector, the Asian citrus psyllid, which I will call D. citri. It has two known hosts, including all citrus species, and Mariah paniculata, which is an ornamental called the orange jasmine. The nymph, uh, this vector has a life cycle, including eggs, nymphs, and adults. The eggs and the nymphs require that early, soft, flush growth on the citrus tree to survive. And so their populations tend to boom and bust as the trees go through their annual cycles of flushing. We also know that among the insects, there are different body colors in the adults. And these body colors have been correlated to differences in their ability to acquire the pathogen and transmit it. And a note that I'm going to come back to heavily in, in a little bit is these vectors as, as adults are also highly variable in their ability to acquire and transmit. In the field and in the lab, it's never 100%. And so to return to this triangle, the rest of my talk is going to focus on this interaction between vector and pathogen. And as I said before, our objective, our, our goal is to find ways to disrupt vector transmission, but my objective is to determine underlying molecular biology linking the two. And so this is a figure I made for a recent paper, and it does a great job outlining what circulative propagative plant pathogen transmission is. And in this case, we have the Asian citrus psyllid, <laughs> and it acquires sea lass while feeding from infected leaves. And sea lass first enters the gut, where it begins circulating until it crosses the gut barrier, entering the body of the insect. There, it continues to circulate, infecting various other organs, until it reaches the salivary glands, where it's known to propagate to high levels. And at this point, it can be spit back into a new healthy plant, completing transmission. And this is the circulative aspect and propagative aspect. And so not all psyllids acquire and transmit CLS equally. A little bit of terminology to understand. When I talk about an isofemale line, in the case of this paper, we're talking about a population that was started from a single female that was plucked from the wild. And all of her offspring that she laid eggs for after coming into the lab were then inbred, and each generation they were assessed for their ability to acquire and transmit CLS. And so Michelle and collaborators in Florida took multiple females, created multiple isofemale lines, and found that over a long time, lots of generations, the each isofemale line had a unique proportion of individuals that regularly acquired and transmitted. And note that none of these are 100%. We also see that there are some that are really great at both and some that are really terrible at both. And so ultimately, not all acquirers, even from the field, are transmitters. And the vector capacity, the ability to acquire and transmit, is variable and potentially heritable. They also showed that when you have vectors that have a high titer from acquisition, they also tend to be good transmitters. And so we know from this that we can use the amount of bacteria in the insect as a proxy for its ability to transmit well. And so I wanted to know, do these differences that we see between isofemale lines in the lab represent diversity of field populations? So this was one of the first things I did as a grad student. I went to Florida and I collected psyllids, lots of them. I used one of those aspirator devices that you have to actually suck up. And like, I felt like I was sick afterwards because my throat was so sore from that motion all day, collecting thousands of psyllids. 
And this was also when I got to actually see what a citrus grove looked like in person, and it was mind blowing. And I want to say thank you to Dr. David Hall and Kathy Moulton of the USDA ARS and Tim Eirig and Shannon Leakey, uh, now of US Sugar, for helping show me around and get access to the fields. So this is a snapshot of what it looked like. You can see there's this pretty extreme difference between each of the four fields. There's also a management difference. Some were organically managed, some were conventional or non-organically managed. Um, and so each one also included maybe old trees or really young trees, and some had been cut down or replaced. And so all of that diversity helps increase the amount of genetic diversity in the psyllids that I was collecting. And I hope to capitalize on that genetic diversity. And so to read this plot, it's important to understand that at the top, when CQ equals 40, those are the healthy insects, they're not infected. And at the bottom, as CQ gets smaller, we have higher and higher amounts of bacteria in each insect. And so what you can see is that each field had a pretty unique uh, phenotype overall of infection uh, among all the psyllids that I tested. And this is just a subset of the psyllids I collected, uh, including a little over a thousand that I finally phenotyped. And so there's two main takeaways from this result uh, from, and this plot in general that there's three broad patterns of infection, as I've labeled here. Uh, Pioneer, for example, was mostly healthy individuals. And this is really striking because those trees were visibly heavily infected. And so why are there so many uninfected adults despite feeding on infected plants? And that I presume that this is because of naturally occurring non-vectors. And this is a really important point that a lot of my research now hinges on. And so my objective moving forward to determine molecular biology took me next to the Decitri genome, because how do you study genetics and genomics and transcriptomics and all the omics without a genome for your study subject? And so this is also a collaboration that started as, a tech, as my technician years. Um, and I started working with the Mueller lab to help update and produce this d version three genome. It's chromosomal level, it's pretty high quality, has a ton of hand annotated uh, genes in it, and it's an incredible resource that much of the work on d could not be done without. Um, and this includes any version of it, one through <laughs> three. And I just want to throw this up here, not to be read, but to emphasize the amount of work that goes into making uh, an annotated chromosomal length genome. <laughs> it's a lot of work and it takes a lot of expertise. Um, and I really want to shout out to Surya and all the other co-authors on that paper. There's like over a hundred of them <laughs> who made this possible. So how has this genome been used so far and how have I used it? So first up, we have haplogrouping. And this is using the mitochondrial genome within each D. citri individual um, from a subset that I collected in Florida. And so Douglas Stuhler, who's actually here in the audience today, he and I have been working virtually for over two years now. He typically works in Florida uh, as a computational biologist for our lab. And this is his, his baby, uh, his project. And so I'm really happy to be able to show it off uh, for him. <laughs> um, and so a little terminology, a haplogroup is essentially a collection of similar haplotypes, uh, often sharing a common ancestor and often like linked to a continent or a very large geographic area. Whereas a haplotype includes a, uh, individuals with groups of alleles that are inherited together. Uh, and this can be, you can have multiple haplotypes in a relatively small area, say a state. And so Douglas was able to pull haplotypes and based on the genomes um, of all these individual psyllids that I took from Florida, as well as other psyllid sequences available online across the world, and map their mitochondrial haplotypes. Um, and what we found is really interesting, but also surprisingly simple. <laughs> that there's one large haplogroup in North America that separates cleanly from the Asian haplotypes. 
And there's one main haplotype in Florida, uh, and it's also in California. However, as you can see, and this is consistent with the separate research that Higgins and I and Michelle did earlier, uh, this dark green circle at the bottom right represents our Ithaca colony, and it is also a unique haplotype, even at the mitochondrial level. So d is also naturally variable in its acquisition and transmission. And I wanted to know what regulates this variability. And so this is that same paper again, but it shows a compilation of 26 generations of inbreeding each of those isofemale lines. And essentially what came out of it was that these phenotypes are consistent uh, and they suggest that there may be a genetic link behind the ability to acquire and transmit. And that's really exciting. And so I hypothesized that it's a heritable quantitative trait regulated by d genetics. So how do you test that? I decided to identify loci or genes regulating vector capacity. And I wanted to use genome-wide association, also known as GWAS. And this is a super powerful computational model that is most commonly used in plant breeding. And uh, it's very, very uncommon in vector biology, which makes it really hard to translate all those computational methods to a sexually breeding insect vector that's non-clonal. And so uh, the phenotype that I was going for was vector capacity. And I measured that by the amount of CLAS in each individual. I also compared that phenotype to the genotype. And this is based on genome-wide single nucleotide polymorphisms. So the whole genome of the insect, all those base pairs, they can vary. And I assessed all of those base pairs. And so to do a good GWAS study, you need a lot of samples. We had 500, and this might seem like a lot, and it is a lot for a vector uh, pathogen GWAS, um, but in terms of plant and human GWAS studies, this is only a drop in the hat. And so more samples just gives you more statistical support. It also requires a really, really good genome as a backbone to compare all of your sample sequences to. And it helps to have really high sequencing coverage or at least sufficient. And so we went with 7x and we imputed, which means there's not, whenever you sequence a genome, there's going to be some gaps, some errors. And so if you stack all 500 of those genomes, you can impute line by line and fix some of them to fill in the gaps. And that really helps a lot. And so we get single nucleotide polymorphisms linked to specific genes and other loci in the genome. And we can figure out whether those SNPs are likely to have a large or small effect. And it may, like we didn't know going into it, would there be a lot or not, or not many at all? And again, Douglas Stuller has played an incredible role in this process. Initially, I did the pilot study on my own. And then once we started sequencing the 500, Douglas joined this project and has been integral to help managing <laughs> the massive files and data. Um, and so I just really want to make sure that you all know that this is a collaborative project now. So sorting biological variation from computational variability uh, is surprisingly difficult. And for some reason, I didn't see this coming. I thought, oh, there's pipelines. I'll just apply the pipeline and move on. So <laughs> the initial pipeline is the molecular side where you collect the samples, you extract the DNA, you phenotype and you genotype by sequencing. And in each of those steps, you introduce both, or you're trying to capture the biological variability, but you're also introducing through sequencing and PCR uh, potential computational and machine-based variability. So then you get to the computational pipeline and this almost summarizes it all. <laughs> and so at each of these steps, there's an additional mathematically based filtering or extrapolation step also modifying the variability. And so all the way down here on the far right, in green on the bottom is the final step where we attempt to filter everything we get based on biological relevance. And this is why having experts is 
on your team is really helpful because how do you know what's real and what's not real? And thanks to Dougler and Edless, Ed Buckler and everyone in his lab who helped me, uh, we have made some amazing progress on this. And I essentially generated a multi-locus network of SNPs across the genome of Decentry. A little bit before I jump into this, this is a Manhattan plot. On the x-axis is the length of the Decentry genome with all the chromosomes colored differently. On the y-axis is the log of the p-value. And this p-value represents the probability that each SNP that is differing between all the genomes is associated to our ve vector competence or the amount of bacteria in that individual. And then we give a significance threshold uh, and everything above that significance threshold, we consider our marker SNPs, our really significant SNPs, the ones that are most interesting, most likely regulating or related to vector capacity. And what we wanna see are SNPs aligning in a peak because that shows that there's a lot of support in that one area. We found, after all that filtering, 615 SNPs down from like 7 million. And additionally, even though that 615 are all above the significance threshold, they each are linked to other SNPs that are nearby. And that linkage can often show us more about the biological variability than just those significant SNPs alone. And so when we add in all those linked SNPs, we add in almost 80,000 more. And this is some basic statistics, including the exons, introns, and energetic uh, located SNPs. So I just want to very briefly try to demonstrate the diversity of the results that we got um, by trying to focus on the apoptosis pathway. And I'm going to link this in pretty soon as well to other research. All of these SNPs and genes where there are multiple SNPs included are directly related to the apoptosis pathway. And this tells us that potentially apoptosis is related to vector capacity at the genetic level. And this is really interesting. And uh, keep in mind that red box, we're going to come back to that one. So I wanted to extend the interpretation of these genome level single nucleotide polymorphism results to say the transcriptome, the next level up, the RNA. And back at this figure, I didn't highlight earlier, but there's a yellow organ and we call this the bacterium. I'm gonna briefly mention that coming up. And so how can differential expression of genes at the transcriptome level how can that inform us about these citrus C last interactions now that we also have the genomic level through GWAS? And so very briefly, early in my PhD, I performed this very extensive, also uh, very computational method where I collected samples from our colonies. I extracted all the insects, organs. Um, I really like microscopy. This took hours, days. And then I extracted the RNA, sequenced them, did a whole bunch of computational processing and yielded differentially expressed genes between healthy and infected psyllids. And these are adults. And essentially what we found is that every organ of the psyllid, especially the major organs, specifically the bacterium, salivary gland and midgut, differentiates at the transcriptome level. And within each organ, we don't actually see a strong difference between those individuals that are infected and those that are not infected with CLAS. But we do have genes that are differential, strongly differentially expected. Yes. And so we wanted to know like, what's the broad trend? Um, but essentially, this result showed us that organ-specific differences can explain over 50% of the variability in our DCITRI transcriptome studies. And this is not the only one, it's just the one I did. There's many others that have used the genome and have looked at various transcriptome results from DCITRI. But they usually look at whole body insects. And so breaking it down organ by organ is a really essential thing moving forward 
to figure out whether these decitri CLAS interactions are uh, localized to a specific region. And so we know that the midgut is the first molecular interface with CLAS. When the psyllid's acquiring it from the plant, uh, CLAS is getting up into the gut and it's theoretically interacting with the gut barrier, or the gut wall, trying to get through to become circulative in the insect. We also know that healthy adult psyllids are resistant to CLAS acquisition. If you take an, a healthy adult and you try to infect it, it really does take a long time. It has to feed forever and it only acquires just a little. But if you take a nymph and you let it acquire and then it becomes an adult, it does a great job. It's a huge amount of CLAS. And so along with this, one of my, the paper from my, uh, from my early work with Michelle studied just the mid-gut and the nuclei in the mid-gut of infected and healthy adult psyllids versus nymph healthy and infected psyllids. And basically what we saw is that nymphs do not have any sort of visual change in the gut when they're infected with CLAS, but adults have so much nuclear disruption, apoptosis, their cells literally explode because they're infected. And this is really disruptive. And it might be, like we hypothesize that this is linked to why they're such poor acquirers because their cells explode. And so you, it makes it difficult to get through the gut. But the cool thing is, and this is why collaborations are really awesome and reading the literature outside your direct field is necessary because there's other Labyrobacter psyllid systems in the US. They just infect other plants. For example, the potato psyllid and CLSO cause zebra chip in potatoes. And for this system, they also have nymphs and adults that acquire and don't acquire. But interestingly, there's no apoptosis in infected or healthy nymphs or adults. But they found that there was this one gene. Remember that one in the red box in the GWAS results, apoptosis inhibitor. When they knocked it out, suddenly the adults couldn't acquire as well and they had apoptosis. And so this is a parallel system that has different like wild results, uh, but it is directly helpful to interpreting our own laboratory results. And so we're still looking into all of the GWAS and all the apoptosis, trying to figure out like, okay, now what? <laughs> How can we leverage this to take care of HLB in the field? That's a whole other PhD, but we know that the story is solid. And this essentially is what I just said. So I mentioned that bio, that uh, special yellow organ in the picture of the psyllid. And it's important to understand as a last element of variability in this psyllid that there's a symbiotic meta community. And this is applicable to any organism. There's always microbial friends and foes at play. And so in the gut, we have Wolbachia, and many of you may know Wolbachia often through like mosquito studies. Uh, and so in other insects, we often know exactly what Wolbachia can do for that insect. But in D. citri, we actually don't know. Is it a friend? Is it a foe? Uh, we know that it's not around 100% of the time. And when it is around, it has really patchy localization. And so this is a story that I haven't been able to dig into entirely in my PhD for lack of time, but uh, it's a really essential story to look into to try to piece together that gut CLAS D. citri story. But we also have the specialized organ, which is found in all psyllids that feed on nutrient poor diets like sap, which is pretty much water. And so Carcinella rudii, shown here in green on the outside of the organ, is known to provide key amino acids and it has a super small genome. Uh, and so without this, the psyllid cannot uh, use its food source effectively. We also have in red in the inside of this organ, uh, Proftella armatura, which is known to produce defensive molecules and it is a decitri specific species of bacterium. And so together these two are integral to the, back, to the psyllids functioning uh, and without them the psyllid will die. But most studies 
don't account for bacterial players. And it's really like if you try to do a, a study of like infected psyllids with a bacterium and infected psyllids without, you can't because the bacterium kills the insect and take it away. So this is another great place for future research, trying to figure out those microbial impacts on the CLAS desitri react interaction. And last but not least, the salivary gland was another organ that came up in that transcript, organ specific transcriptome study. And working with salivary glands is both exhilarating and really difficult because they're clear, <laughs> they're super sensitive, super soft, uh, really hard to extract. But if you can do it, it gives us a lot of information about the possibility of, or the, about the ability of desitri to transmit because without the salivary glands, there's no transmission. And so uh, we know relatively little <laughs> about this organ. And uh, thanks to a retired entomologist, Joe Cicero, uh, I was able to get my hands on some incredibly dense samples of salivary gland extractions. Uh, and from those and their, and their transcriptome differential expression, we were able to pull out some possible proteins that may be effectors that help mediate either the psyllids interaction with CLAS or CLAS interaction with the plant or CLAS interaction with the psyllid. We don't know yet. We just know that they're potential effectors and they were differentially expressed between infected and healthy. We are working on that in the lab at the moment, trying to figure out more about the functional role of these proteins. But again, this is the downside and the fun part of omics research. You get a list and then what? <laughs> <laughs> um, and so that's a whole other PhD again, figuring out the functional description of each of these lists. In short, we've covered a lot of variability in this system, even just from the vector pathogen side. There's other labs across the country that focus on psyllid plant and plant bacterial uh, molecular interactions, and I recommend that you go watch some of their talks if you want to know more about that side of the system. But I wanted to try and distill this into, if I had endless resources and endless influence, what would I recommend for HLB moving forward and the management of this disease? And in our lab, we strongly believe that controlling the vector is a clear path towards long-term management of this disease. Because if you don't have vectors transmitting the pathogen, you don't have disease spread. You can plant new healthy trees and they don't get infected. But right now, most people test the trees. And because the trees come up with false negatives, it's an issue. But because of the GWAS results and this concept of naturally occurring non-vectors, I just wanna throw out a radical idea because it's an exit seminar and I could do that. What if we could replace the entire wild desitri population with entirely non-vector desitri. This is a similar idea to what people have proposed with mosquitoes. What if you could replace a mosquito population with uh, sterile mosquitoes? And so they don't, uh, or they breed and the offspring are sterile, something like that. We could do similar with, with desitri vectors. Um, and so our GWAS results suggest that there are specific genetics underlying natural non-vectors that we find all over in every population we've ever surveyed. And perhaps we can selectively breed them now that we have some gene candidates. And, I, and so I propose, <laughs> let's knock down that still a population in Florida and release non-vectors to replace the population and replace the genetics available for breeding of whatever's left. Uh, obviously, long-term plan. Breeding, selectively breeding insect populations is also a long-term hard uh, project to accomplish. But the idea is there and the proof of concept has been applied in mosquitoes. And last but not least, I work in the field of vector biology. And through my PhD and even my undergrad, I've realized that genomic resources are a rare commodity and they're really much, they're in dire need. Um, we have an Ag 100 pest initiative 
to try and generate more genomes publicly available. We also need, though, more bioinformatic training for people who work on vectors and pathogens, not just plants. The people who work on plants and use bioinformatics are the amazing resource that needs to be spread. Um, the knowledge there on the computational side is as tall as Everest. <laughs> so yeah, and also it would really help if we could standardize some pipelines, understand some common pitfalls in vector biology, computational analyses, and if there was a way to teach how to filter biological data from computational variability um, for everyone who happens to work on a vector pathogen system and wants to do omics analyses, that would be really helpful. So I don't know how I'm doing on time and we got behind a little bit, but I have two, two last slides that reference my time as a grad student at Cornell. As Michelle said, I've been really active because I strongly believe in positive mentoring uh, and having work-life balance and like enjoying your work, even though it's the classic PhD is to like struggle through and then be like, ta-da, I got it. But you're still living and many of us are growing through our 20s, <laughs> that pivotal time of our lives where we're figuring out who we are. Um, and so it can be really difficult to mentor and to be mentored because we don't know what we want <laughs> um, in not all, not all cases. And so I try to read and I read a book by Mary Piper called The Middle of Everywhere. And she described 12 attributes of resilience. And I thought I would put this together as like a power, as a slide to try to demonstrate that you can become more resilient to down, to pitfalls and downturns and the regular ups and downs of the PhD by trying to make sure that you have all of these. And if you're deficient in one, try to improve on it and you'll probably find that other aspects of your life uh, get better from that. And last but not least, this is a nod to my efforts to generate a entire committee through the, the Grad Student Association on mentoring and advising. And I'd like to take this opportunity to preach this to the entire department rather than the grad students. There are many different aspects to mentoring and advising, and one person cannot do all of them. It's actually impossible. And so what I urge from each of you is to think about for your mentees or as a mentor, and this applies to department-wide and individual labs, where are the gaps in these that you're experiencing or that you're providing? And how can we make sure that everyone has all of these? And I think that if we can easily say, yes, we have a community for this student. Yes, we have a role model for this student or this PI who we just hired. It'll help a lot. And with that, I'd like to acknowledge my lab. There's been a lot of people, as Michelle said, that have cycled through over the years. This is our latest lab photograph, and there's even some people who've left, left since then. I want to thank my funding, the NIFA AFRI Pre-Doctoral Fellowship. I want to thank my newfound family and expanded family. My cats, they've been here all six years. And my fiance. With that, thank you very much. We'll take questions from the room first. Yes, in the back. So the question is, does d play any be beneficial role in the ecosystem that it's in? Uh, to our knowledge, no. In the US, it's an invasive insect uh, sourced most likely from Asia, though there's a many uh, imports to Florida that could have brought it there. Um, but in the US, because it only feeds on citrus, um, and citrus is a monoculture here. Uh, no. Yes. You might have mentioned this, but is infection of these three um, harmful to you? So the question is when the psyllid is infected with silas, is it harmed? Yeah. Uh, and that is a great question. Um, we have some hypotheses about that. Ultimately, the answer is I don't know. But it looks like in some aspects, Yes, and in some aspects, no. For example, there's higher fecundity 
when they're infected, but they die sooner. <laughs> they can fly farther when they're infected, but they love to feed on infected plants, which are an even poorer resource than the normal sap. And so it's, it's a yin and yang kind of effect. Um, and that the, the ultimate um, answer to that is still out there. Yes. I wonder if there's any research show So the question is, is there any research suggesting movement of the vector yeah. from north to south or south to north across the American continents? Yeah. Uh, across the sea? I don't know. So for a little context, Brazil also grows a ton of citrus um, and they manage it very differently than the US. Um, and so theoretically, uh, they, they export a lot. And so the big question is like, where did our silids come from? Are we sharing them? Do they migrate? Uh, I don't have an answer for you about that uh, movement of vector. Um, there's a lot of hurricanes that go through this sort of broad geographic area um, and they are bound to push insects around at high altitudes. Um, but no, not that I know, not that I know of, there's no research on that. Let me see if there's any questions on Zoom. Any other questions here? Oh, okay. Uh, we'll go with Gillian <laughs> since you're not in my lab. <laughs> How do you account for the lack of diversity in the Oh, how do you account for the lack of diversity in the Ithaca colonies? Um, yeah, so essentially we are continually inbreeding and subsetting them. I think in this case, we're actually not aiming to improve diversity. Our goal is to try to find a sort of homogenous, easily understandable system. Um, and obviously, I just highlighted there's tons of variability through genetics and uh, transcriptomics and every other level of omics as well. And so the fact that we have stable, stably infected and transmitting populations is actually pretty remarkable. Um, but I would say if you want genetic diversity in a vector population, don't use a colony. <laughs> you collect them from the wild. Did that answer your question? Thank you. Uh, Stacy. Yeah, so now that you have these candidate SNPs in your address, like how do you, what would be the high, most high throughput way with what we have in the lab? Mm -hmm. so, uh, your vision of like how to further yeah. find that path. So this is something that I hope to get started in the last like two months of my PhD as well. There is a lot of published data and a lot of data that we have access to as well in our lab, such as proteomics, metabolomics, additional transcriptomics. I wanna compare my candidates firstly to all those data sets. I wanna pull out a holistic view of what is changing um, and what is constant and what is in every single one, because maybe that's a false positive. Um, and starting there, I think, would be basically comparing all the data sets. Um, we now have, thanks to the GWAS, it's the first <laughs> opportunity to get a genetic level diversity assessment. And so we now have the full picture from all the D. citri C. last perspectives um, and all the levels. And so, yeah, I would start with a very in depth literature review. Ironically, <laughs> as far as lab like molecular techniques go to what's next, um, you wanna do some kind of functional analysis. And so based on that list, I would pull out some top candidates. I, we know that there's some candidates uh, that overlap with humans, for example, um, they're homologs. And in humans, we have uh, therapies to address those kind of genetic polymorphisms that cause disease in humans. And so what would that therapy do if we address it to the psyllid? I don't know, but there's a lot of opportunities to functionally annotate these uh, results. Michael. Well, does the decision pressure compare 
California, and Florida. So how does the desitory pressure uh, change, uh, vary between Florida and California? So it's a really good pertinent question because in Florida, we are heavily infected with psyllids. In California, we know that there are psyllids heavily infecting backyard citrus, like people's personal citrus. And there have just started to be uh, results saying that there are psyllids in, that are infected in commercial groves, which is a big deal because so far we haven't found any or they haven't been proclaimed. And so there's a lot of hypotheses about this. Again, it's like, why wouldn't California be only a couple years behind Florida? Instead, they're still surviving just like they were 20 years ago while Florida has tanked. Um, mainly, we think it's environment. They're slightly farther north. Uh, there's different valleys. Florida's very flat. They have hurricanes. California avoids many of those massive storms that can help distribute vectors and pathogen. Um, but ultimately, that's a question to be determined. There is uh, somebody at the University of Davis, I believe, um, who models insect pathosystems. And I think he's att attempted to answer that question. How are we doing on time? OK, thank you very much. This has been a production of Cornell University, on the web at cornell.edu.